Good evening, everybody. Good evening, everybody. All right. That is one of the favorite ways of opening the show for the great Louis Armstrong, shown here in 1961 in the shadow of the Hori Mechet, and also known as the Sphinx, with his wife, Lucille. This is a man who Ozzie Davis said had the power to kill a man in his home. Son of Kikongo, born in Congo Square, New Orleans. Louis Armstrong, an expert in what I like to think of as dark matters. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight, dark matters, Africana practices of discovering and recovering knowledge. We're going to have an Mbongi tonight. Because everybody say that for me, Mbongi. Mbongi. Mbongi is a Kikongo word. It simply means a house without rooms. In other words, a place where privacy has no room. The Kikongo would say, what you say belongs to the Mbongi. It is the word made active by coming out of your mouth. Well, we all have different thoughts tonight, but tonight we're going to think about this question of discovery. We're going to see several lenses on discovery. But to talk about discovery, we should probably talk about cover. What you're seeing there is a picture of one of my favorite places to hide and think, one of my shrines. It's my, one of my little small, small work desks there at home. And underneath those spectacles and a couple of pamphlets there, what you'll also see is a big book in the foreground. That's a mug there with the Sankofa symbol from the New York African Burial Ground. More on that in a moment. But uh, in, that, in that big book, that's one volume of the uh, condensed version of the Oxford English Dictionary. You know, we always send students to the dictionary. We should know what we're talking about as we engage in the conversation. So let's talk a little about what it means to cover something. To cover, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, means to put or lay something over an object with the effect of hiding from view, protecting or enclosing. So we know what it means to cover. It means that the thing existed, but it's hidden from view. Something is obscuring our view of it or our ability to perceive it. Well, then what would it mean to discover? Well, to discover, obviously, would be to divulge, to reveal, to disclose to knowledge anything secret or unknown. Similarly, to uncover would be to disclose, to lay bare, to make known. But the Oxford English Dictionary would, would, would go so far as to say to do that by the removal of some covering thing or matter. So you got to move something in order to discover it or uncover it. Well, what would it mean then to recover? To recover would be to take back into one's possession, quote, something lost or taken away. It's different than discovery. We can presume that things exist in reality, and it's up to us through our curiosity to discover them, to reveal them, to uncover them. But to recover would be to become aware again of knowledge that perhaps we had already discovered and forgotten we'd discovered. The Akan people have a word for that. They say san kofa. Let's say that together. San kofa. San kofa. Literally, go get it. We see one of the Akan gold weights in the picture there, and you see how small it is because you see an actual shilling piece there and it, it compared the size. The Akan would have a, a bird looking backward, sometimes with an egg in her mouth, but moving forward. In order to move forward, you have to recover. You have to remember. You have to literally become aware of the thing that you may have known at one time or another. We live in a universe. Tonight, you'll hear a little bit about dark matter and dark holes and all the things that are between you and I. And as we vibrate through this universe, things that we have to discover. Beautiful pictures. We take Howard students to Southern Africa a lot. And every time we're in South Africa, I just love to go outside and look at the sky. There was an exhibit at the Smithsonian Museum of African Art a couple of years ago on African cosmos. I encourage everyone who didn't get to see it, or even if you did, get that catalog. Because in article after article, scholars are talking about the things that Africans knew about the cosmos and the universe. One of the things that is mentioned in there, but not covered, that we cover in great detail here at Howard, because we're one of the, in fact, we're the only HBCU and one of the few universities in the country where you can study classical African language, the Egyptian language, in every stage of its classical form. Here's a word from our ancestors who studied the stars. This is the word that it signals the dark matter. We would say in the Egyptian language, as we would sound it out, the great noon. Let's say noon. Noon. 
The noon for the Egyptians is the idea of the stuff we're made of. We're made of the same natural essence, the primordial stuff, the dark matter, the thing we can't perceive, but the thing that in fact exists. Well, what happens when you become aware of that thing? For them, they would say that moment of awareness, that endless consciousness might be expressed as the thing that is hidden. Their word for it would be, one of their words would be amun. We have it in contemporary language when we say amen. The literal translation would be the unseen one, the hidden one, who although hidden is the source of all life, power, and health. But once we become knowledgeable, once we become knowledgeable, once we understand that a thing exists, they have another word for that. That word is rech. Let's say that together. Rech. Rech. To know. To know a thing. These Africans thought about it and said, you know, it's one thing for a thing to exist. It's another thing to become aware of it in time and space. But to be aware of a thing is not enough. You have to share that knowledge, which is why they talk about the way that the universe communicates itself to itself. And they say that everything that exists, exists as a speech. Their word for speech, medu, after me, medu, medu, medu to speak. We see the demonstrative there, the person with their hand to the mouth. But we also see the staff to speak. Experience allows us to speak. Knowledge allows us to speak. But it's not enough to speak with your mouth and with your life. You must, in fact, leave a record for those who come after you. You must become a scribe, a sesh after me, sesh. Sesh means to scribe, to leave an inscribed record of your discoveries. Well, here are some Howard students and faculty. Love going to the Nile Valley. There again, where Louis Armstrong was in the shadow of the Horemekhet the Sphinx. And there we are, love to go because you're there on a journey of recovery. There's a Howard student staring up, looking at Ramesses II presenting justice in the form of Ma'at to his wife Nefertari in the temple at Abu Simbel, not too far from the border of the Sudan, now northern Sudan. This child is looking up like, wow, looking at herself, really. That's her great, 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 grandmother long before boat rides, long before cotton fields and sugar cane fields. These are the ancestors speaking to each other. And she can read what's on those walls as she presents justice to his woman. And, you know, people say, well, I'll never go to Kemet. Well, that's my mama up there with her hand on a scribe. That woman was born in the cotton fields of Alabama, Russell County. It was my sworn duty to bring her in conversation with herself to understand that we have a history that transcends long before that little boat ride we went on yesterday. Very important to understand that conversation because when we understand that conversation, we understand we're talking about dark matters, matters of discovery and recovery. Like the books at Timbuktu, children who are born to be librarians in Mali, in the Western Sudan at Timbuktu, when they are born, often they are brought to the books and the first thing that they see on this earth because they cover their faces, they raise their hand and say, the first thing you'll see on this planet is the thing you'll be responsible for, which is the written knowledge of our people. People say, you've been to Timbuktu? Not yet, but I hope to go. It ain't too far, because we have journeys of discovery in the form of books. The Kikongo people, like the Kemetic people, like a lot of our people, like to write. We like to write on stuff, walls, our bodies. The Yoruba people would say oriki, which some people translate as praise poems, but what you might think of more conceptually as anything that can be written is a text. So they write on everything, their clothes. And we brought all that stuff on those boats. I love that picture of that sister there. That's, that's a sister in the order of the good death in Salvador Bahia. If you live your life well, you've, lit in, you've lived an account that you can leave for your children. And when you leave that account, sometimes you may bring your science with you. That, of course, is one of the great murals by Hale Woodruff that hangs in Talladega College that is right now at the Museum of American History here in Washington, D.C., of the Amistad Rebellion, Singh Bay and his people, who, when being captured on this boat, looked up at the stars and said, we don't recognize these stars anymore. Take us back home, because this star map doesn't make any sense. And because they were fooled by that star map, they had to rely on somebody who had them enslaved to sail them. Well, they ended up in New England. And of course, we know the Amistad trial began the argument that eventually would explode a century and, and 20 years after that into the Civil War. We still fight in that struggle to claim our humanity in society that doesn't see us as human. But that is different than knowing a thing and recovering your memory. And eventually, they would, the stars would look right, like this brother whose parents came, grandparents came out of Africa, Benjamin Banneker, who studied the stars so well that eventually he became a master of star charts, a master of understanding how movement had been discovered. And 
His expertise was so great, in fact, that he was called upon to help design the federal city. Some old heads still refer to Washington, D.C. as Banneker City. That's how you know folks that came of age in the 1960s. George Washington Carver, who would rise early in Alabama and go out into the fields and talk to the plants, and more importantly, listen to the plants. And he said, you know, the plants told me what to do. And this man had a master's in chemistry, but his journeys of discovery were based on the principle, fundamental principle of discovery, which is what? Listening for revelations, because if everything that exists always existed, the only thing that has to be improved is our awareness of it. So he communed with the plants, and when they told him what to do, he showed the world what they could do. And that's why to this day, we honor George Carver. Come a little bit closer to the now, there's Mae Jemison. Love this sister. Travel through space, get a little closer to the stars, even though we're all made of stardust. But this sister's not just a scientist, doesn't just understand medicine and the stars. When she was an undergrad, she also studied Africana studies and a dance. She's a dancer. Because those journeys of discovery commingle. The sense of wonder is consistent. We went through the schooling and education. We trained ourselves coming out of that civil war. We came to places like Howard University, journeys of discovery, whether it be James Neighbor in law, whether it be Charles Drew in medicine, whether it be Sterling Brown in English and humanities, whether it be Edward Franklin Frazier in social science, whether it be, uh, whether it be uh, Rayford Logan in history, or whether it be the great Elaine Locke, thinking about the question of being human in the world. And these young people. These South Africans, this was in the New York Times a couple of years ago. I just love the picture because they are intense. That sister right there is like, you better not get this wrong. And the girl in the middle is like, everything is depending on the answer. That's what discovery looks like when you do it collectively. And finally, we take a group of students from Howard University to the New York African burial ground every year, the freshman class, to remind them, to remind them, in fact, of the role that Howard played. When a federal building was building, being built in, in lower Manhattan, and black folks and others from around the five boroughs stopped the bulldozers and said, you've dug up bones here, and those bones belong to our ancestors. And when the argument started raging and they said, we need scientists to, to explore the lives of these people, these folks said African hands should touch African people and study their lives. And they said, well, where are you going to find enough of them? They said, Howard University. And for 10 years, those ancestors' remains were on this campus. And when they went back, we went back with the grand regalia, left this city and went to New York and reburied them. And every fall, we take the freshman class there to remember. We think about something the Egyptians would say, cherish study, avoid the dance, so you'll become an excellent official. Write diligently by day, recite at night. Let your friends be the papyrus roll and the scribal palate. Such work is sweeter than wine. It's from the royal scribe, a man known as the Sesh Neshu. Neshu means king, the royal scribe. Ne ma ret not to the scribe wuni mi di imun, imun, the hidden one, in the 20th Kemetic dynasty, 3,500 years ago. It is our journey of discovery that we must recover. It is our journey that we must bequeath to the next generations as Africa and Africans reclaim their place in the human family. Good evening, everybody. So I think we have a couple of minutes for questions, questions. Hopefully I'll have some answers or somebody else will in the audience. Anybody have anything they want to ask or comment on? I can hear you. Yes, sir. thing that they're, sub they're like called to do, do you think that they receive things like messages? Because like you said, everything's a speech. Yes. So like, do you think that they receive things like messages from the substances that they're working with? Absolutely. Many human traditions, in fact, talk about the power of silence, the power of meditation. The ancient Egyptians had a phrase, medu nefer. It literally meant good speech. We know nefer because we've already heard the word, uh, the name Nefertiti, right? Nefer means beautiful, beautiful speech. They argue that the speech, the first speech we have, the human has, is the thought. When you're quiet, you're with yourself, but you're with everything you remember and, and everything you've experienced. So when Carver is out there in the morning, in silence, he's thinking. So the metaphor he used was the plants were talking to me, but how beautiful is it when we have found the thing that we love 
and we are in community with those speeches. And if any of you have ever been to Tuskegee to the museum, see what he did with the plants. I think that's a beautiful way of phrasing it, of the calling. And the calling, the speech, is in here, which means it's everywhere. But we have to be quiet to hear it. That's beautiful, brother. Thank you. Yes. Oh, Baba. Yes. Uh, have you, do you know what people from Africa you come from? Uh -huh. Well, you know, I'm told by some of our great scientists, and we have a few of them here tonight, Georgia Dunstan, who works here at Howard, of course, the great Fatima Jackson, that once you get past your great-grandparents, it gets a little blurry. So you take a little DNA test. Now, we took the DNA test. They tell me you're a bi. But here's the thing I claim. I claim African people, which means anywhere I go in Africa, I claim those people. When Louis Armstrong went to Ghana the first time, Louis Armstrong went to Ghana, got off the plane, and they had assembled all these trumpet players and band players to play one of his beautiful songs, All For You. And he saw somebody in the crowd, he wrote, that looked exactly like his mother. He said, this is the place I'm from. But when he went to Congo, they said the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so I really think. And in Nigeria, they tell me, oh, look at your eye, look at your nose, Fulani. I said, yeah, but you got to look at those Negroes we co mingle with when we were fighting to get out of Alabama, which includes some of the aboriginal people of this. So, you know, it's very interesting. And, of course, Africans are the first humans. So in that sense, everybody in here is an African. But most directly, I would say probably you're about, but, you know, I claim it all. Asante, Bob. Uh -huh. Of course, the Bamu, yes, sir. You talk about God, Amu. Amu, yes. Ba. It's the same word, Ba. Bamu. Ba and Ba would be soul in Kemetic, but Moon, Bamu, it could be Amu, which we talk about the work of Sheikh Abdul Jawab, uh, Sheikh Abdul Jawab, Abu Bakri Musa Lam, uh, Babakar Saul at the University of Sheikh Abdul Jawab in Senegal would argue that the migration patterns went from east to west. When people say, why y'all talking about Egypt? Y'all from West Africa. First thing they're saying is, I don't know much about African history. The second thing they're saying is, I never studied the languages or the migration patterns, because you're absolutely right. He would argue, that's, all three of them would argue, those are long words. Uh -huh. Oh, Cameroon, no question. That's why you hit that drum like that. The best drummers come out of Cameroon. That's what I've been told. <laughs> That's it. So thank you, Baba. So with that, thank you all. Asante, have a good evening.